Yeah. So, so on the one hand, we have that problem with religious liberalism today that sounds more like a doctrinal evolution and corruption view than anything. And then on the other hand, what we have is uh, some who want to say um, that you can completely discard the living magisterium because the living magisterium can be subject to doctrinal error to the extent of teaching heresy. And this isn't coming from a liberal perspective. This is coming from more the extreme right. So earlier we spoke about uh, doctrinal reversals, and we, we all agree that there can be doctrinal reversals because the church can teach non-definitively. There could be a level mm -hmm. of error in the magisterium of the church. But then the question is, how high can that error be? Can it ever be of the note of heresy? Could, it, could you ever have the universal magisterium, that is the Pope acting as the universal teacher or an ecumenical council? Could you ever have them teach heresy though non-definitively not not teaching it definitively we we all agree that's excluded but some are going to say but you could have a universal organ of the magisterium teaching heresy perhaps a pope non-definitively teaching heresy in a papal encyclical or vatican II non-definitively teaching heresy in nostra etate or something like that what where do you weigh in on this question <laughs> Well, uh, Nostra Aetate is Nostra Aetate is very important. Nostra Aetate is true, and Nostra Aetate is um, the Church's response to the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so no, if you're going to get rid of Nostra Aetate, um, that just shows um, profound, profound historical ignorance. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, and and really tragic. It's a really tragic thing. But but uh, anyway, so that's a, sort of my two cents on that. But the 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 real the issue that you're talking about though is a broader one. Now, here, I think this we got to make a few distinctions, and we, you know, one thing that we got to say is that, um, you know, uh, what is heresy? Mm -hmm. Well, so heresy would be um, if, if like you have a pope who teaches, and here I'm going to define what I think heresy involves. It would mean teaching in a in a weighty magisterial document, not just offhand remark, sure. but teaching in some weighty magisterial document, not infallibly, but but nonetheless, teaching against a dogma, well, let me be more specific, teaching directly and explicitly against a dogma of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So a heresy then would be if you have a dogma that has been taught by the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. and let's just use, um, let's just use that, uh, you know, Nicaea, you know, as one. Mm -hmm. Like if you have a if you have a pope in an encyclical say that Jesus was that Arius was correct. Mm -hmm. Explicitly and directly say Arius was correct. And unfortunately the church got that wrong. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so that'd be an example. And so there that's what that's what I would say would be papal heresy. Now mm -hmm. now you could um, different from papal heresy is the idea that um, a pope could teach something that isn't true. Mm -hmm. you know, and I and I think yeah that that popes can popes and councils can teach things that aren't true, mm -hmm. um, as long as they're not teaching infallibly because not everything that they say is infallible. You know, yeah. so I don't I don't have a maximalist understanding of infallibility, yeah. but I do I do deny that certainly after Vatican One if you if you read the um, the text there of the you know the whole text of, of defining um, defining but also contextualizing you know the um, infallibility of the Pope. I certainly think that papal papal heresy defined understood the way I just defined it mm -hmm. uh, is not possible is is not possible in, unless unless maybe you could have some papal heresy followed immediately by the end of the world by Jesus coming and. <laughs> But but there's all sorts of reasons why paper heresy is not possible um, theologically, and and they're you know they're rooted simply in the in the fact that um, you know what I mean. Well, I'm, I'm just going to have people go back and read the read the text from Vatican One, and, and mm -hmm. I think it becomes clear. But so but papal error though is a different thing. There mm -hmm. there can be papal error, sure. and we do need to remember this whole issue like of direct and explicit teaching. So so you can have a pope that undermines a dogma. <laughs> Yeah, you, you you certainly could. You you could have an encyclical that undermines Nicaea. It undermines it in some way. You yep. know, yep. I don't. You know, it, not directly and explicitly 
um, rejecting it, but somehow undermining, you know, and well, then what you would need is theologians to kind of say, look, you know, um, this, this needs to be evaluated here. This, yeah. this teaching yeah. that the Pope has taught something that it needs to be respected and the Pope needs to be spoken about respectfully. Mm-hmm. But, but theologians do need to evaluate it and to measure it against the dogma, you know, mm-hmm. um, the dogma. But, um, but I do think, no, a, a Pope cannot explicitly and directly um, reject a, a dogma of the Catholic Church. I think that's impossible. And I think if you hold that, if you believe that that can be done, then, then you're really in a you you've made the you made the dogma of papal infallibility into nonsense because because what happens then is that the pope is infallible whenever he happens to be infallible and then he's a heretic whenever he happens to be heretical, <laughs> but look that's that's completely uh, you know ridiculous because you know you, you honestly you could have a pope <laughs> infallibly declare something on on Monday mm-hmm. on Monday you say I solemnly ex cathedra declare you know that Mary is bodily assumed in heaven. And then on Tuesday, that Pope could say, in an encyclical, he could say, Mary was not was not bodily assumed into heaven. Right. And and it's right. just like, what's the purpose of, of the dogma of papal infallibility? He's he's the Pope is obviously, you know, it's ridiculous. So if you if you believe that the Popes can can explicitly and directly teach heresy, then what you've done is you've made um, a laughing stock out of the dogma of papal infallibility, and you've done it as a theologian. Yeah, I mean, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, but then you you also, look, um, Catholics also need to be take care of how they speak about the Pope, and Newman did yeah. that. You yeah. know, Newman was an opponent of Pope Pius IX. Newman Newman fought it. Uh, Newman fought a lot of what Pope Pius IX did. He fought yeah. it, but he, he fought it in a proper way. Yeah. You know, yeah. He, he spoke respectfully. He was docile, and he um, he understood he was just a theologian. He, he, didn't, he didn't engage in private judgment. He he um, he understood he was just a theologian, but he he had a place, and so he he interpreted. You know, he he did his best. He was not a dissenter. He Newman was quite careful. So like when he is responding to the syllabus errors, which contains things in it that Newman did not accept, um, you know, he he accepted he accepted all in the syllabus errors that had been you know was dogmatic. But he does said, look, a lot of this is not dogmatic, mm-hmm. you know, and so there is room for 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 a question here. And sure. Newman was quite right, quite right about that. Um, but he was very respectful in, in how he did that. He was not a dis- what he was not a dissenter. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button and the subscribe button. God bless.